Hello everyone, welcome to the first interview of Tournament Strategy Week here at OC University. And those of you guys who are new, OC University is basically this improvement-focused OSU hub where our goal is to sort of bridge that gap between top players and the general community. So in keeping with that theme, something we do here is basically a series of top player interviews where we dedicate one week to a specific topic. We have a bunch of interviews lined up this week to talk all about tournament strategy in time for OSU World Cup season. And joining me today for the first interview is Azer, seasoned veteran. Hello, hello. Hey, how's it going? Hey, man. Good morning. <laughs> so good morning. I think probably a lot of people recognize your name from something maybe what this is a lot of things i feel like people might recognize you for <laughs> but just in case anyone is not completely aware of who you are could you just give a brief explanation you know who you are in the community and what people probably know you as uh so prob <laughs> i mean people probably know me for a certain play in 2015 but beyond that um uh, i've been uh I've been playing tournaments since uh, 2013. I used to be uh, ranked uh, number 10 at the game quite a long time ago. So I've, I've been relatively active this entire time. Uh, I think I was kind of there since the very beginning of when tournaments started being a little bit serious, around 2014 or so. Um, right. I've been uh, playing the uh, OS World Cup for eight years now. Uh, I've stopped playing since and i'm now organizing it as well as some other community tournaments like corsets so you're, um, you're a big dog yeah, <laughs> <Huge>. sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah i, I think i've got I, I like uh i don't know I, I think a lot of people provided me with a good experience in those eight years so i i like uh organizing stuff now to see if i can give it back you know oh that's that's good yeah i think when you mentioned tournaments first getting structured in 2014 like even back then, or you said getting more serious, but it still was kind of unstructured back then, I feel like. So oh, yeah. for sure. So yeah, so you said you, yeah, your first tournaments were around twenty fourteen. Is that um okay, so I guess can you take us through how you first got into tournaments and I guess some influential people or things that happened to you around that time? Sure. Uh I don't remember what the first one exactly because it wasn't e a particularly good tournament like it didn't really have a format back then uh, obviously like discord and like twitch to an extent weren't really a thing so uh, at least not in the osu community where like the twitch obviously was a thing um so tournaments were like organized on forums and there wasn't like a like a meta for oh, organizing them there's no discord or, like, no any discord. map pools or anything so yeah it was it was very chaotic unless you were like the world cup you know so tournaments weren't really organized or cared about it was just like some fun thing to do um so i don't remember which what the first tournament i participated in but it was in 2013 uh the first like real tournament i played it would be owbc 2013 um i think beyond that though i think uh there was uh the na tournament nat was a thing back right. then as well the 1v1 tournament uh and then after that i think in 2015 things started picking up not just for me but just for like tournaments in general like a lot of people started organizing uh, community tournaments and uh yeah i was playing it all all right let's go so do you have any i guess insight to like early day strategy especially when things were a bit more chaotic like was there even much strategy involved or like how would you say you determined Ooh. picks and bans things like that back then that is reaching really far back uh, <laughs> I, mean, I don't think I remember too much being different. It's just that you wouldn't really have like, you know, how there's solo play skill sets and I guess like tournament play skill sets now. There's oh, like a clear true. divide between both. Right. That wasn't a thing back then, right? It was both of the same thing. So you could actually like look at someone's profile and you could tell what kind of player they were. Oh, that's so like interesting. You could tell if they could play Hard Rock or DT or whatever. Right? Obviously, you would know like some of the you know like the non -pro profile stuff like low ar wouldn't be there right but it was it didn't have nearly as much of a presence back then right like back then it was just like here's this ranked map that everybody knows and plays and it's going to be in this tournament for the next three years because there's only like a limited <laughs> amount of maps to go off of you know yeah i remember map pools used to all be like popular maps and ranked maps especially 
So yes, there's a there's always this uh, this big stress about making all the map pools ranked maps to yeah. to guarantee quality because generally ranked meant it was quality and there was very low chances that an unranked map was actually of good enough quality so it it worked for us back then that's true that's true um and also like map pool structure was also not really a thing like at all even until like 2018 or 19 as -hmm. far as like designating a specific skill to a certain slot the base yeah the base structure was always there that's hasn't really changed at all I think that was determined before I started playing, so I'm not quite sure. I know it was, it was there in like 2012 or so. I wasn't really paying attention to tournaments back then, though. So, but yeah, for sure, the the slots weren't like defined individually until much later. Right. So, I want to sort of okay. So, like, I guess we can talk about like scouting players. And you mentioned looking at people's profiles back then actually kind of worked, and. What exactly has changed so that that's not really the best way to go about it these days? And then also, what is a good way to go about it? Um, there's uh, let's let's just say PP inflation kind of ruined that scouting aspect. Not just inflation as a whole, but the skill sets that you would be interested, like the information that you would want, is no longer present on someone's profile because, like, their top plays, for example, have no relevance to their tournament play in 90% of the, uh, the cases at least at the uh, like the tournament levels that I've played at I'm not sure right. if that's true for all of them yeah I think but, uh, that yeah that, that information is just like not actually available on someone's profile anymore that's uh, true whereas it certainly used to be but um yeah I think nowadays if I were to scout someone uh beyond just looking at their results in like the previous rounds of whatever tournament we're talking about um most people nowadays that are serious about playing tournaments will list off all of the tournaments that they've played in like their user page or like in a google doc or something right so, oh that's true uh you can get a lot of like information from that just by looking at like the match results from there like the mp links oh and that's a good if you point. care okay. enough about scouting enough about that player because uh i i don't think this is applicable to all levels again i i think but i mean you know this as well whereas like if you're playing at the top level you know everybody that's true so you don't need to do that scouting. You already know like what everyone can and can't do, you know? Yeah. And even if you don't know someone, then like someone else does. You can just ask. I feel like Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the community is I guess relatively small in that sense. So mm-hmm. yes. I do want to actually touch on okay, so that that's more about scouting players figuring out what they're good and bad at. Okay, so let's actually walk through each step of a tournament match and I guess talk about like how to prepare for different types of things. So first thing to talk about is warm up. Warming up for matches either um, preparation beforehand, but then also like sort of waking up the day of the match, like all the sort of things related to that. So so whatever I'd, thoughts come to mind, you can just throw them out right. there. Right. Well I do a lot of my preparation uh my preparation would be not the day of i would i would do it much in advance i actually do a lot of preparation in terms of um not so much scouting but mostly like statistics if that makes sense like actually getting an accurate uh representation of the performance that i expect of my own play and then uh making an educated guess as to the exact same thing for my opponents right so right. Uh, and that allows me to determine what I'm prioritizing in that match. If there's an, it lets me pick my my pick bands, you know. So that's always the first thing I do. I do I spend a long time doing that, regardless of if it's a one v one tournament or a team tournament, or if I know my opponents or not. I will always do that because there's always some there's always some things you might not be aware of. Uh, I'm sure that this is going to come up later again, but like. Uh, there's always some skill set that you're not thinking about about yourself that you're not particularly good at but if the other guy is worse that's a good pick for you right but that's you wouldn't, true you wouldn't think about it because it's not something that's good for you yeah so, or so you would think but in this right. particular context maybe it is so i think uh going through statistics and actually going through match results and and having an idea of like what the other opponent can and can't do um is super helpful in that regard yeah, something I emphasize a lot when I tell people about like you know how to approach a tournament match is that it's really not about getting a good score. It's just about getting a better score than your opponent. 
Like if you if you suck at a map and your opponent sucks worse, like you can't both lose. Although you might feel like you deserve to lose, then <laughs> as long as long as you get a higher score than your opponent, that's what matters. And there's also the other side of the spectrum. I think like the biggest match that comes to mind for me is like Bubble Man versus Vaxe in Gameosu. Like insane performances from both players, but like a one x one hundred FC will not be an SS. So yeah no matter how well you play also. So just sort of keep that in mind. It's not all about your own strengths and weaknesses. It's also about your opponent. So yeah, so I think so far you've mentioned like looking into statistics of like your own scores on the map pool and sort of comparing that to how you think your opponent will do. Mm -hmm. Can you actually talk about how you go about practicing map pools? Like how much is too much? Like how do you know when you're done practicing a map pool for the week, basically? I think a lot of people have very like uh, sh strict and exact methods to do this kind of thing. I kind of don't. Uh, <laughs> there are certain maps that require that kind of thing, like all of the reading things, right? Um, no matter what kind of reading it is, anything that you can't sight read comfortably, obviously you'd want to practice so that you don't mess up right. in that regard, right? But you have to keep two things in mind i think or at least i i keep two things in mind one um uh, i don't know if this is true or not but at least for me sight reading is always a kind of a buff it makes you pay a lot more attention to every single object because you don't know what's up you don't right, know what's coming right, up right. you don't know what's the hard part you don't know anything so it has your 100 percent focus right so and I don't necessarily just mean sight reading as in, as in like literally your first play. It's just like something that you haven't really practiced, right? Right. Uh, but also on the flip side of that, if there's also mind block that I think you had a bunch of interviews about as right. well, right? Um, I think if you, there there's like uh, and there there is too much practice to the point where you're gonna get mind blocked on like simple things, right? So it's about like finding the balance between right. those things. And for me, that heavily depends on what kind of map it is. So like. I think notoriously like an aim map, like a Nomad 1, you don't need to practice that. You play it once, and then if there's nothing that caught your attention, you're good. You never play it again. You keep going. You you play the rest <laughs> of the pool, and then if it's picked or if you want to pick it, then cool. Go for it. You right. know, you're know, you not going to be mind-blocked. You played it once. You at least know there's nothing that's going to take you off guard, and then you're you're safe, you know? Yeah, but yeah. If, it, if it's anything that has a lot of rhythm complexity, or maybe the map isn't so intuitive, or low AR, or any... I, you you should at least play all the maps like once or twice to figure out, hey, is there something that I'm not sure of here? And as soon as that answer is no, then you just stop playing that map. Yeah, I see it the same way. I think when you're practicing a pool, like you should play a map only if playing it will teach you something new, basically. Mm -hmm. So like obviously if you haven't played the map, then playing it once will teach you something new because now you know how the map goes. But beyond <laughs> that, if there was nothing that tripped you up, or actually if there was, so... If there is like a reading map or a gimmick or something like that that has like perfect stacks or something that's very weird to read, then keep playing it. As long as you're learning something new each time you play it, then I think it's fine. And sort of just to give a recap on what exactly mind block is to those of you not familiar, basically, if you've played, okay, so mind block is basically when you stop reading the map and you start just kind of playing from memory. And that um, backfires when your memory is not actually how the pattern goes. Because you like you completely stop focusing, because you're you're like oh you know I I know how this pattern goes it's just a square you just move in a square and then you end up not moving in a square and then it's like oh no I think for me part of what mind lock is just to give a small answer is, is if if you ever play something for the first time or the first couple of times you play a hard section but you hit it every time you're not going to think that it's hard because you hit it every time so That's then true. you stop paying attention to that because it's not worth paying attention to you hit it every time and then you know after that things go wrong because it's still a hard pattern. Right. And I don't want to get too off topic, but I do want to add that like how your first run goes or I guess how your sight read goes on a map actually I think plays a big role in whether or not you get mind block or like mm -hmm. your sort of mental going into a certain section. Like if there's a really hard pattern, but you end up hitting it in the first try, you might not even notice that it's there. So Yeah. Uh yes, but with that, so that is pretty much your perspective on like how much you should practice maps do you ever okay so this, this might be jumping ahead a little bit but in team tournaments where you know that you're not really going to be playing everything like to what extent do you ignore like maps in the map pool 
like should you still try them at least once like let's say you know that you're never going to be in for like a reading map in the pool or maybe uh, let's see, probably use stream or extreme slash speed stuff as an example mm -hmm. like if you know you're never going to be in for a map like that at what point do you just not even play it once and at one point are you like maybe i should still try it i think understanding your role in a team is super important right so in my own case purely just my personal experience i've for the last several years i've been a specialist i'm here to play this that and that thing and nothing else i don't ever have to touch anything else because i'm playing with other people that are playing those other things right so in those situations then yeah like i'm never gonna play a stream map uh or anything that like would be considered speed or high approach rate like i'm not good at that my team knows that uh no one is even considering that i am pot potentially playing i could play that map 96 times and I'm not going to get a better score than like anyone else on the team that is supposed to play, right? So at that point, there's just no point. Right. I'm just completely ignorant. Yeah, I, I think also understand, yeah, like you said, understanding your role in the team. And also, I guess you have to understand your teammates' roles on the teams as well. And sort of, okay, so in a team tournament, not everyone on the team is going in for every single map. So just sort of a brief explanation. So for a four versus four tournament, for example, typically you have eight players on a team. This is how the World Cup is designed as well. So you have eight players on a team, but they're not all playing every single map. So you put in four players that you think will perform the best. They go into the multiplayer lobby, and then they are the ones that play that map. So if you're not one of the four players in the lineup, as it's called, then yeah, what Azer is saying is that you're not going to need to play that map. So understand, like, but yeah, oh, but I, I think there is so. That is only true for maps that you, you have 100% certainty that you're not playing, right? Right. It's important to differentiate that. Uh, to give an example about myself, I'm not good at hard rock, but I can play it. I'm, I'm not particularly bad at it. It's right. not why I'm there, but I'm still going to spend some time playing them on the off chance that maybe my team can't play it or <clears throat> I'm better than... Uh, someone else who should be playing it that happens pretty frequently actually so yeah. it's still important to go through the things that you could play right and in that sense i i mean it really doesn't hurt at the end of the day to take like two to four minutes to play through a map once and see how you do and also okay one thing and let me know your thoughts on this but like people who like don't get a very good score and so they just like don't put anything in the sheet at all Although their score might be like decent, like 300k or something. But I guess in my opinion, like tell your team how you do on maps. Like I guess be, be transparent because even if you're definitely not going to go in, then you want to save the couple seconds between maps of like trying to think about whether or not you'll go in for that map. This is uh, something I touch on a lot, actually, when I'm the captaining any team. So like I was captain for seven years for OWC Canada, for example, and every single round, even though it's fairly obvious who's playing what, I still spend the time to ask each person individually uh, not only how they play on a certain map, but also how they feel about that map, if that makes sense. Right. Sometimes someone will do good, but they don't think they'll do good every time. Uh, sometimes someone is just going to have a bad score on the sheet or whatever, or in all of their practice, but it's just because like they're not having a good day all of those days and you, they they think they'll do better you know there's a lot of like nuance that's like important to right. know in that regard so do you do you i guess make sure everyone on your team has at least one score for each map or like at least a feeling number if it's something that they could be going on for you then yes okay i see so like again same thing that we just talked about right if it's a map that there's no chance they would be playing then i don't care right so Okay, I think that's mostly more about team tournament dynamics, um, where you know you have your role on the team, and other people have their own role, and that sort of determines picks and bans. So I want to also talk about one v ones and how that is sort of different. Hmm. So one v ones for me are a little bit weird because I haven't played them in a very long time. Uh, I think the last one I played was in twenty eight. Oh my god, wow. late 14. Um, yeah, last 1v1 tournament I played was NET 2018, I think. Oh, wow. Uh, 
for me specifically, the only reason for that is I'm a specialist, so that means I can be speed abused and several other things that like a well-rounded player will generally beat me, right? So right. because of that, I've kind of just stopped playing 1v1s because I'm not able to play the the to the way I would like, if that makes sense. Right. Um, but I think for most other players who are going to be w more well-rounded, I think uh, there's definitely a lot of difference there because it's obviously it's yourself. You don't have to worry about anyone else. You can't be, you know, it's you have to be very aware of your own performance because it's 1v1. You can't be carried. You can't yeah. carry anyone. Like, it's it's much more... Uh, I th I think in that regard also, I think in 1v1s it's probably way more important to research uh, re research your opponents. That's true. Uh, because you'll be able to find a lot more of those like um, skill sets that you might not be thinking about that you have an advantage on or don't have an advantage on, right? So yeah, yeah. it's a lot more obvious when it's only one person to look at instead of eight. Yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think also it's important to understand that like you personally have no one to back you up but your opponent also has no one to back them up either so mm -hmm. if you so one thing is like when you're in a team tournament and you're not feeling confident on a map like nomad one aim map for example you can back out and someone can probably take your place but if your aim is not feeling that good in a 1v1 like you'd better hope your opponent doesn't notice <laughs> or else you're gonna yeah. get abused so yep that's th there's a lot of like little things that like um, I guess just to give my own example, I played a 1v1 against Flying Tuna a couple of weeks ago, and he's, I think, known for being really, really good at aim, but I think most of the picks that I won against him were actually aim maps, because I think I picked one of them, and I noticed he wasn't as consistent as I had expected, and I was like, okay, he's probably not doing super well on aim today, so that that is something that I think is important to pick up on and see how your opponent is doing on that specific actually... day. Also about that, I th think it's easier to do specifically for 1v1s, but if you play with the leaderboard on or whatever, you can kind of tell regardless of if the map you're playing is like specifically an A map or not, if there's like a specific section that they kept missing on, right? you can kind of make that connection, right? Like you can kind of see, oh, they completely uh, blundered the aim section on that one, <laughs> maybe I should pick aim. And right. if you just looked at the score at the end, you wouldn't necessarily have that information. You know what I just because thought Because you of? just have their score at the end, right? So it right. doesn't specifically say about each section of the map if it's, uh, yeah. You, what if you spend your time between picks, like you go back to the like the main tournament VOD, and you actually watch how your opponent <laughs> missed? I don't, I don't think anyone actually does that. I don't think anyone don't does think that. I don't have time to do that. I don't think you really do, but in like those very small cases where like you're really torn between certain picks, or like... You played. Oh, although yeah. you could do that in team tournaments, I've, I I do that a lot in team tournaments. Oh, if that's I'm not true. playing and I don't specifically need to warm up, I, you watch. Right. And you see if if there's any moments like that that you can pick up on. That's true. Yeah, I think when you're on the bench in a team tournament, I, yeah, let's actually talk about that. Like things that you can do on the bench. There's basically like two different roles. I feel like either like you're warming up or you're watching the match. But yeah, what are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Um, I think unless you specifically need to warm up for something that's mechanically intensive. So like if you're a speed player or something and, and you need to be warm or and you're on the bench, then yeah, maybe just keep warming up. Uh, I think if you don't need that warm up, then I think there's still some like productive things that you should that you can do, you know? Right. You can think about, uh, obviously you can watch if the tournament is streamed, uh, if you can watch how the other team is doing or how your team is doing, right? Right. Uh, but you can also just like look at um more specific things and think about like, for example even if you're not the captain in your team or whatever and you're not really a decision maker you should still be able to to look at how your own team is playing or just get the information about individual players about how you think they feel about something and then when the map is over you're like hey uh you know hey uh, habib you're doing really good on this map do you want to do you want to play more of this oh that's actually and true uh I, I am the best at that map, by the way. I'm just a beast. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows that. <laughs> well, um, like, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of like more like I guess like the social aspect that you can do to it if you're right. not playing, right? So yeah, yeah that's true. I I think like picking up on if a teammate is like sort of on a hot streak, so to speak, or like has momentum or like is having a really good day, then you can try to pick around that player, right? 
Mm -hmm. um like if your like aim specialist player is having just like a really consistent aim day then you can probably lean more towards aim picks things like that and on the other hand also obviously if your specialist is having a bad day then try to avoid those maps and hope your opponent doesn't notice (laughs) so yeah yes i wanted to mention something oh uh, i think this is also probably kind of obvious but like when your match is close to tiebreaker sort of deciding like okay so let's say the map match is one map before tiebreaker and you're not in for like the deciding map as to whether or not you get to tiebreaker then chances are you probably want to play through the tiebreaker and tell your team how you feel on it because mm. in close maps 100%. a lot of people sometimes get very uncomfortable or anxious about whether or not they'll do well so even if you feel like there's a 0.01% chance that you play the tiebreaker, you should still play through it and sort of get a feel for your confidence level. Um, to a certain extent, okay, if if the map is like super biased towards a certain skill, then you, okay, you can also take the role of like deciding what other players should be on the team or like in the lineup for tiebreaker. You yeah. know what I mean? Right. So yeah, that is Man. that. Anything you want to add? The only... Uh... Yes, I, w- I was thinking about an example of that that I could say from my own experience. Unfortunately, it's not a good one. Oh, no. Uh, because it would be versus Taiwan in OWC last year, where match was exactly like that. Right? It was pretty early stage, so like, kind of everyone could play everything, if that makes sense. Right. Uh, and we got, to, we got to tiebreaker, and I'm not supposed to be on, on the tiebreaker because like, I was mechanically probably the worst player on that team. So there in no no chance I should be playing the tiebreaker, but I practiced it anyway just to make sure. And then as it turns out, uh, three of our tiebreaker players went in, they felt confident, and the three other people, I guess the four other people that should have played over me were all too nervous to play. So I said, All right, I'll play. Uh, <laughs> I don't I don't particularly want to, but if none of you want to play, then I'll play. That's funny. And uh that, that didn't go super well for me, but <laughs> <laughs> I think you still won though, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. I had nothing to do with that, though. I, well, no, I may, maybe there's a chance that the nervous players would have done worse. Who knows? Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I remember that, though. That was, um, <laughs> <sighs> that wasn't a round of 32. I remember the tiebreaker, but not by name. I think it was round of 16. Oh, shit. I don't remember either. Yeah, yeah anyway. Um, yeah, I, I think deciding who goes in for a map. Yeah, do you have any other, I guess, things that you want to throw out there about? deciding who should go in for a certain map um yeah sure so i think some of the things i've picked up on for being a captain for several years is that um people are never it's never like a binary thing about like yes i'm playing this or no i'm not playing this you know there's a lot of maybes there's a lot of uh depends on how i'm feeling at that given moment you know and you can know that in advance yeah so if i'm uh, figuring out lineups for all of the maps. Usually, what I would do is there are people that are that are just there 100 percent of the time, like they're always consistent, and yeah, you know you, you can safely just put them on yeah. for that. And like, even there's if also a lot not. of maybes, right? So you can like confirm three of the four slots, and then have like two or three players for that last slot. And then when that map comes up, or if you're thinking about picking them, uh, picking that map, you just ask all of them how they're feeling about that map right now, right? So right. it allows you to. Uh, make better decisions about the roster and not just have like a set four people and then just you know fuck it just go for it like <laughs> right i think uh it, it's a better better success rate yeah i think try not to bar people from playing a certain map i don't think that's really something people do but when you're strategizing before the match yeah basically like have a couple of people in mind as like backups to go in for that map that you still want them to feel out if they might play it during the match but yeah there's there's also definitely like you mentioned players that like even if they're having a bad day they're still going to be like one of the top four players to go in for that map on your team Mm -hmm. so and also i guess for for clarification top four meaning like in a 4v4 tournament um if it's if it's a 2v2 for example top two on your team but yeah um so, oh, okay, let's talk about, like, actual warm-up maps in the match. <laughs> what are your thoughts on warm-ups. this? As in, like, tournaments implementing warm-ups before the matches? Yeah, yeah, like, like each team gets one random pick. 
I think those have not been used um, for their intended purpose for a long time, <laughs> which is why they've been removed in the World Cup last year, right? Early right. two years ago. They, uh, I don't yeah. think that's actually of any use for anyone who wants to use it specifically to warm up. That is uh, true. For two reasons. One of them being that if someone is looking to warm up, they're going to do it before the match, not during the match. And the second reason is usually the way that would go is that you do warm ups and then you do your picks and bands. So you lose your warm ups. What was the point? True. I think what it's really designed for is to, I think, warm up to the match environment specifically. And also, like, if you need to turn your leaderboard off, you can do that. But you can also just do that before you join the lobby anyway. Yeah. I think. I thought you were going to say, like, about nerves, but I don't think that works. Oh. Okay, yeah. Some people I think say like, oh, you can like get, let your nerves out during the warm ups. Like you can't really do that. I'm gonna be honest. Yeah, that doesn't work. Because you know that it's a warm up and you know like you know when it's actually the first map or not. So Yeah, maybe you could like mind game yourself into pretending that it's still the warm up and then it doesn't actually matter how you do. <laughs> There's a lot of mind games you can do if you like. Um I mean, we can probably talk about that later. It's like sort of mental tricks that you tell yourself. Yeah, I have I have the perfect story for this, but oh. we can go over it later. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I think the only other thing with like strategically picking a warm up. Okay, this is something I've done where if I'm having a decent, like, let's say my tapping speed or stamina is like actually decent that day, but I don't want the other team to know, then I will pick a stamina map as a warm up and intentionally do bad. And then afterwards in the multiplayer chat, I'll say something like, Oh man, my hands are so cold. Like, why why can't I stream today? And then it's something like subtle like that. It's like, uh, okay, maybe not that blunt, but it's just, I just type something like, "Dude, my hands" or something like that, and then hope they don't ban streams against me or something. Or like maybe they'll pick it into me and I get a free pick. <laughs> that is something I did in the United States Cup 2018 against um, it was like Toy Fiery Rage, um, that whole team. In grand finals uh yeah we still lost <laughs> but it was a good well, try <laughs> I, I guess i'll mention my story now because yeah, yeah. it's incredibly relevant oh really uh, and it was successful so uh in owc 2018 before canada was really that good we we're still like top six i think but we weren't like considered to be any better than that we were against australia uh in quarterfinals i think and australia was a team that had every possible edge at dt over us it was clearly like if we could ban all four of the dts we would in a heartbeat no second thoughts right, right? so there, there oh, were yeah, two dts this. specifically <laughs> yeah i've told the story many times because i'm very proud of it uh it was one of the rare like actually like strategical moments that paid off really well because you don't get those too often let's right. be honest um so we knew that for a fact so obviously we wanted to ban one of them uh but in that tournament you only get one band so there's two of them that were 100 percent losses for us so, so for context we, we knew there were they three... wanted to pick the other one because we only could ban one so let's right. say i think it was dt2 and three which are speed and stamina okay so we banned i think it was dt3 and we had the first pick and we knew that they wanted to pick dt2 so abusing the fact that it was the first pick of the match and everyone is nervous we just said screw it we're gonna lose this map let's get it out of the way let's pick dt2 and let's lose it so that they like we take away one of their picks. It makes no sense. But when you word it specifically that way, no one ha no one had any pressure to do good because everyone was prepared to lose the map. We were just kind of messing around. All right. And what do you know? We won the fucking map and the other team shit the bed because they were super nervous. It's their first map uh, of the tournament. And we won the map. And then we literally won that match because of that. Like it still went to it went to tiebreaker. But we kind of had like. We didn't have any other better picks. Like we had like four good picks, and that was like the fifth one. So oh, I see. it wasn't it wasn't even a good pick, but like <laughs> that's the fifth pick that we did, and it just worked out perfectly. If we picked it uh, at any other stage of the tournament uh, or of that match, or if the other team picked it at any other good stage of that match, because then obviously they would pick it when they want to, right? And when they're feeling confident on it, so we just force them to play it when they're not. So yeah. then they had to also think of another pick that they. Uh, maybe are less comfortable on right so it just worked out like really well i i tell this story a lot because like um right. in the grand scheme of things when you look at like strategy uh like strategy in 
osu tournaments there's not that much that you can do at the end of the day you kind of just play the game and hope you play better than the other guy right so right. that was one of the few moments where there was like an actual strategy and it like worked out really well yeah i think canada is very known like very strong at like confidence and team morale and in that sense i think you guys do a good job at like building a team environment that supports not really getting as nervous as some other teams that might be very try hard and oh my god let's win mm -hmm. let's win and i think you guys also more so than other teams try to opt for like those sort of nerve-wracking type maps or like consistency no more one aim stuff um i think multiple times you guys were like let's throw no mod one at him if we have first pick and <laughs> we'll just out nerve them basically so yeah, I think yeah, there's a lot you can do, but I think having a good team environment is one of the most important parts of the game. Right. Is there anything else you wanted to mention about like mental sort of gymnastics for not getting nervous during matches? Um, I think there's probably a, a lot of things that have already been said, not necessarily with this interview, but uh, or a lot of things that are for the most part easier said than done. But I mean. The one thing that I personally go for is during the match, I try my absolute hardest not to care. I care a lot before the match and after the match. During the match, I just do whatever. I don't think about uh, oh, what's going to happen. Right. Uh, I'm going to do good on this or else people are going to think I'm bad or any. Just phase all of that out. You just show up and play and that's it. You know, whatever happens, happens. And then there's, I, I find that. In, re in regards to nerves to be the best thing to do I think and whenever I'm in any tournament team I try to support and enforce that mentality as much as possible right. uh, that's why I like joking around a lot I think I'll always try to do that I'll try to pick up people that do that as well because yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think having a more like lighthearted environment is just always going to be a better thing Wait, sorry, I, I was like, I just saw one of the questions on the forum. Do you think speed abusing on boomer hidden players is unethical? <laughs> uh, if I say yes, people are, are going to think I'm a hypocrite for abusing low AR hidden and reading on zoomer players. Oh my god. Okay, that's a good answer. <laughs> it really goes both ways. Oh, my, that's such a good question. So, so the answer is no. <laughs> it's, it's just a part of the game. Yeah, that's funny. Um. But yes, I think, yeah, and I know people, so especially in the nerve control interviews, I know Zudi talked a lot about confidence and how important that is. And, you know, Canadian pride. <laughs> okay, well, she didn't talk about Canadian pride, but in the sense of confidence being, I, I think, like very characteristically strong amongst the Canadian team, I feel like. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, and, I think part of yeah. that is. At least what I think, I never really like confirmed this with any of the players we played with, but obviously when you look at a team, there are some names that are going to be like more looked at than others. You know, you All have right. like your star players. And I think if you are one of those star players, I think it's if you're able to do it well, trying to uh, shoulder as much of the expectations as possible is a good thing for your other players. Yes, that's like, true. I would always try to do that. Uh, I've I've tried to do that from the very start, right? So like, um, especially when most people during the time where most people looked at the Canadian team and put my name at the top of that, you know, right? Uh, like immediately think of of Azer when they think of Canada. Then I would try to abuse that as much as possible and kind of like how do I word this? Sort of like ego my team a little bit, right? And like make my team like kind of realize that like hey I, they're looking at me no one's looking at you guys you can do whatever you know and then they feel less nervous right yeah, yeah. That, that's actually true i think um you know that you can be like very sneaky in mm -hmm. you know just like sneakily get a very good score in, in a map <laughs> but yeah definitely agreed i i had I think a similar experience yeah so i think basically to summarize I oh god my my train of thought is dying. Um. Okay. So. Wait. Hold on. Sorry. <laughs> my brain. <laughs> um. Okay. Telling your teammates. Okay. So there's like two roles basically. Either you are expected to be one of the better players going in or not. And I think either way you can have like certain expectations going into the map. Um. 
like we can actually so you already mentioned sort of being the star player you can tell your teammates you know to not put so much pressure on yourself and and that actually usually works because i've done that as well but being the sort of yeah, I mean, fill player even on both sides of that right like, right in both the star and and the the I don't know what the word is. The guy that Phil gets player. carried, I guess. <laughs> the fourth Phil player, sure. I usually call it the fourth. Um, I think. I think. Realistically, and I think everyone can agree to this. If you're looking at eight people say, play, you're not looking at the people that are doing the worst. You're That's looking true. at the people that are popping off. So, like, if you're one of the people that are expected to do the worst, then you should have lower expectations and care less, and you'll be less nervous and stuff like that. I don't know why this is all about, like, nerves, but <laughs> yeah, I, I, <laughs> I think it's a lot of what goes into tourney strategy, because, like I said, there's not a lot of it. That's, that's true. actual strategy, right? So. Um, oh, actually, I do want to mention... Uh, okay, so I don't know if we ever played any tournaments after, like, I started emphasizing this a lot more, but, like, when you struggle on a certain pattern in a map, don't tell your teammates. <laughs> Is that something you've sort of... Oh, yeah, because then they become aware of it. Yeah. Right. So we were talking earlier about how, like, if you if there's a hard part of a map, but you hit it in your sight read, like, you might not even realize that it's hard. And vice versa, there might be a simple pattern, but, like, you always miss it. And so in your head, it kind of seems kind of hard, and you're inconsistent on that for that reason. Then, okay, how, how strongly can I, can I emphasize this? If you are mind-blocked on a map... Do not tell your teammates because all it's doing is making them think harder about those patterns as well. Like, if I, I ask you, fine yeah, to mention about the map as a whole, but never mention specific patterns because right. then they'll start thinking about it and be like, "Okay, when's the pattern? Is this it? Yeah, Am yeah, I gonna yeah. hit it. Okay, did he hit it? Then it's yeah, yeah. It's like, is this the pattern you were talking about? That wasn't that hard. And then you're just thinking all these things, and then you just miss after. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I think, okay, so for United States Cup 2020, or 2021, yeah, yeah, this year, a couple months ago. So in grand finals, I told my team to, okay, so I think personally, I was more of like a sit-in player. I think I played pretty much every map. And so for that reason, I wanted to make sure I was feeling fairly confident and like my, you know, I wasn't like overthinking things. I think it's really easy to overthink if you have information to think about. Or mm -hmm. sort of the opposite, like if you don't have certain information, then you can't think about it, right? So w during the grand finals for like strategizing, I told my teammates to sort of do the strategies for me, but specifically to not... Okay, so I told my team to make a separate text channel for strategies for the match and like so that I could mute it. And then I told them if they want to talk about the other team's scores, put it in that channel. I don't want to see any of the opponent scores from previous matches from like how you think they'll do in this match like all i want to focus on is my own scores and how i think i'll do and i think that worked pretty well because like by the end of the match i like realized that i wasn't really thinking about the other team's scores cuz i think that's a cause for a lot of nerves i feel like and mm -hmm. yeah I don't know. let me know your thoughts i guess I've never been in that position because I've always been one of the people that are doing the strategy. Right. I mean, I'm but typically I, like I that. So clearly see the benefit if you are not. Right. I think that's a good idea. So, yeah, just throwing it out there. I think those of you who are sort of in that position, like if you can do that, or I guess also like understand your, your own preferences. Also, like if you feel more comfortable knowing how you think that your opponent will do, then, you know. But also, I think, like we mentioned, there isn't too much like strategic advantage that like gives you a buff on the other players. Like in the actual map, like in, in an actual map, at the end of the day, you just need to play well and mm -hmm. do your own thing. So, yes, I do want to grab a couple questions from the Google form, and then probably move on to live chat questions. But sure, is there anything else that you sort of wanted to throw out there? And I guess, um, what's the word? Key takeaways, things like that, that we've talked about so far. Key takeaways. Um, do all of your planning before the match, like actually way before the match. It's super important to me, at least. Um, and then just turn brain off during match. <laughs> just <Right>. play. <laughs> <laughs> just play, dude. 
All right, so a couple... Oh, okay, some of these questions are actually very interesting. And if you see any in particular on the forum, because I'm not going to ask all of them, but uh, yes, there is one question directed specifically at you from Polsky1, which is, what tips would you give to people who just started or are just about to start their first tournament? Ooh, uh, I get... Every time someone asks me a question like this, I think it's very hard for me to answer because... And I think most people that started a long time ago can probably relate to this. It's just that when I started, the environment of the game was very different. So I don't have any like firsthand experience of what it's like to start playing whatever we're talking about, which in this case it would be tournaments, I guess. Like I don't have that firsthand experience. Right. So it's a little bit hard for me to like give pointers for that. One thing that I think is really good though is there is a lot more um lower ranked like lower difficulty tournaments that have less stakes that i think are fantastic to play if you're just looking to improve right like if you're within one of those scale ranges right um and even even at the top level there's a lot of tournaments that are not really serious you know like just that are just there to mess around right not bad or whatever among like, us tournament i think those are, are good experiences to to get into because there's just like you don't have to deal with the stakes i guess because i think a lot of the people right. would start looking at those things and that would be a, a, a cause of a lot of issues i think like nerves and underperformance and stuff like that right so right actually is there a specific time or like sort of era of your tournament career where you feel like you sort of stopped crumbling under pressure as much as you had used to or something that you sort of did in your earlier tournaments i think everyone did yeah no i think everyone always starts off that way for me i think uh it highly depends on how active i am i think like very early on i stopped getting nervous but as soon as i take a break for like six months or whatever and i just haven't had that experience as of recent then sometimes they come back you know oh I right get the, i start to think about things that are not specifically re relevant to that tournament or that situation i'm like okay well am i still you take a break for a long time, you know, like you come back and you're like, okay, am I still as good? Should I be here? Like, oh, right. uh, I got to be good so that people will think I'm washed, you know, like <laughs> these types of things that true. don't necessarily happen in the tournament, but, you know, like surrounding it. The, the whole That's thing, true. Right? So, That's true. But yeah, I think like really early on, I didn't really have nerves because um, I was kind of, how do I word this? Uh, from very early on, because there were very few tournaments and very few like, star players and that was when i was kind of at my peak in terms of solo play um i was kind of like thrust into the situation of like a star player if that makes sense like right very very early on in like 2015 2014 even that's true um so sometimes you just don't have a choice you know you just gotta learn how to play with that and i think eventually it just goes away or you just learn how to deal with it yeah i, I think just play a lot of tournaments yeah, I've had a similar experience where like if I take a break for a while and then I come back, it's like my tournament nerve control is kind of rusty. Yeah. So yeah, all right, let's see. A couple other questions. And and by the way, if I ever move on from a topic but you want to just add stuff, just, just cut me off. Mm -hmm. But yes, okay. So talking about I guess boosting team morale and I guess things like that and, and strategizing, what value do you see in like coaches? Or like people outside of the team who don't actually play any maps. And this is a question that came from Boytek through the forum. Uh, I think those things, if done by the correct person, are very beneficial. Um, but I think if it's just someone who is just there and just saying like, "Okay, guys, let's go. You can do it." <laughs> it does nothing. <laughs> like right. it has to be. Uh, they have to it has to be a little bit of a distraction maybe or something that um calms people down makes them laugh All right uh again like i said i really value it, uh, like a team environment being lighthearted. someone that is able to assist in that process is always nice i think yeah and okay actually now that i think about it i feel like there's like two types of like people that might be there as like a coach type person either so so either they create an environment that's like it's like they're watching you and like you feel pressured to do well or else like you're gonna let them down. Um 
or there's the type of person that creates an environment that's like yeah this match literally doesn't matter you're just here to have fun and yeah just, that's just me. <laughs> yeah 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 I, I think that's the, that's the better way to go about it because if the person's there it's like go oh, guys i'm i'm like you know I, i'm betting on you guys basically then then it's like oh man like you just sort of think about like i think that actually leads to like when you're playing like when you're playing the map like every time you hit a certain pattern it's like oh is that going to impress the person or something like that so or like if i miss this is it going to disappoint the person because those are the sorts of thoughts that lead to nerves in the first place i feel like so i think like the biggest like your biggest enemy whenever you're playing tournaments is yourself right like your your own thoughts true yeah, most yeah. of the time like how you handle nerves and expectations and stuff like that so if you have a coach in your team that is contributing to that negatively then you know it's not good right right like but... anyone that is any creating expectations at least like mid-match uh not not a good thing right uh do, do you have any thoughts on like having people outside the team for a strategy like pick band strategy things like that hmm i can see it i mean most of the time i think the people that are best suited to do strategy are people that are playing themselves because they have a much more like firsthand understanding of how things are right uh there's a lot of nuance that you don't really get if you're a third party yeah so i don't know i think it's just harder to make the correct decisions you don't have as full of a picture but i mean it can it can work i guess right and especially if you don't have anyone on your team that is um uh, willing to do strategy or good at doing strategy because i guess it can be a little bit hard to have a full grasp of um uh, full teams you know like everyone can be confident about themselves uh in a team or if they're playing 1v1 they can be confident about themselves and their opponents but not maybe not as a, as a whole team you know right i think uh that can be a little bit overwhelming especially if it's in a tournament where you're not familiar with either your team or your um your opponents right like sometimes you don't have that information you don't have that experience of playing with or against those people so it's a lot harder to get a full picture of what they can or can't do yeah i think it would be interesting to play in a team environment where the like none of the teammates think about strategy at all and it's all sort of outsourced a and ninth man <laughs> i think that because sort of what i was talking about with like not thinking about the other team scores at all like you just sort of i guess imagine a situation where the coach like individually reaches out to each player to ask how they feel on certain maps so that like no player on the team is thinking about like the other players on the team mm -hmm. and sort of not creating any expectations like your only focus is on your own gameplay and doing well on like the maps that you're in for and then come the time of the match like uh, yeah i just think it would be interesting like having very little say on like what picks you like you do i could see it answers. working but i feel like we haven't seen that yet right just because most of the time if a team is formed at least one person on the team uh knows enough about what they're doing to do the strategy as well right so That's i think you have to like specifically create a team like that yeah and also i feel like all the people that would be really good at doing that coaching are just going to be on another team anyway so they're not <laughs> going to help you so actually we've had um I don't really remember this as much, and they didn't do that much, but we've kind of had something like that. I think it was in like 2014 or something, where I, I still don't know why this happened, uh, but we had like a retired Korean player help us for OWC named Crazy, like A oh, R Z Y. Right. He was just helping us, like, uh, I don't really remember because it was like seven years ago, but right. he was helping us uh, get a better picture of what the other teams were doing and not just our opponents but like the rest of the tournament as well like that's interesting uh, i don't remember him doing much of like the actual like pick ban strategy stuff but i guess we have attempted that a long time ago but i don't remember much about it that's interesting um okay i think any other questions or like things that you wanted to mention and then we can move on to viewer questions in the live chat uh, for me, not really, unless there's something else in the forum. Oh, all right. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple other questions, but I do want to make time for viewer questions if there are any. So, 
Yes, those of you listening live through our... Can, oh, uh, I can look through the form real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can do that. But uh, just the, those of you listening live, if you want to get your questions in the live chat, so there's a text thread in the general channel. And go there, put your question. And what we do basically is if you see someone else's question that you also want asked, if you could react to it with a thumbs up emoji, and that way we can keep track of everything, see which questions should answer. But yes, if you see any questions on the forum, Azer, if you wanna, um, if you wanna just I think, read I think them. Boytech just has a lot of really good questions, honestly. I don't yeah. mind going through a lot of these, but I think they're very relevant. Yeah, yeah go for strategy. it. Uh, we can do like, we can like rapid fire. Yeah, you go for it. Yeah, I'm rapid done. fire discussions. Let's go. Okay. Should you ban what you're uncomfortable on or what you know your opponent is very good at? Um, I think... What, what, what do you think about that, actually? Let's hear it. Okay, so this is basically, should you ban your weakness or your opponent's strength? And it, yeah. it depends on, like, if the difference between you and the other player, like, whichever one's greater. Like, if you're weak at something, but the other person's also kind of weak, then, like, if your average score on that map... Okay, actually... It's basically like whatever map your average score is furthest away from their average score or expected score. And that could be something that you're bad at or just something that you're decent at and they're way better at. So yeah, look more towards average score of you and your opponent rather than just banning your weakness or just banning your opponent's strength. I think when you ban your weakness, it's also very important to take a look at the other team or the other guy because that might also be their weakness. Right. Yeah, you know, like there's a lot of, I I think most of your decisions when it comes to banning mostly revolve around the opponent, not yourself. Yeah, uh, that's let's true. Say, you know, like I get I have no speed, so it, in most tourneys, uh, I would get speed gap, especially if I'm playing one v one. If any, literally anyone is able to play the maps, they will win. But sometimes you get a match where the other person it also isn't able to play that map. So why would you waste a ban on that? You know, right. I think, most of the time you're looking at the opponent, not yourself. Yeah, I think there is some cases where like I might 1v1 10 different players on the same map pool and have like 10 different maps that I ban. So yes, all right, next question. You can take the lead. OK, what kind of mindset do you have versus weaker, equal, stronger opponents, respectively? Does your strategy change? I think your mindset changes. I think your mindset strongly changes based on who you're against. Because uh, the expectations that you have going the match changes a lot, right? Uh, especially if you're like, see, if you're going in a match where the opponent is weaker, uh, you don't really care about that match. You can most of the time you're you can kind of like, it's unsafe to do, but you you can sort of like disrespect them in your head a little bit, you know? Like, right? Okay, but if the opponent is weaker, I don't need to strategize that much. But I think that can backfire really hard because if you have a bad read on them, turns out they're not weaker. That's going to tilt you very hard, and uh, it probably won't end well. Right, it's tortoise um, in the hair. Yeah, and stronger opponents, I think, also kind of kind of on the, the flip side, uh, versus stronger opponents, most of the time you're going to be coming in expecting to lose, and that's perfectly fine, right? Right. Um, but the moment that you are not losing, uh, you'll need good nerve control, I think because that's going to start affecting you. I think if you're unexpectedly doing well, um, that can affect you a lot. Right, and then against equal level opponents? Equal is kind of like the baseline, right? So I guess that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have a specific way to, to think about okay, an equal opponent. That's true. It's just like the way you think about any tournament match. Right. But I think uh, one thing that is... Uh, oh, one thing that's actually really important... Uh, yeah, actually, just a small extension to that. Uh, most of the time, you're against a weaker or a stronger opponent. It's going to be in an early round, right? Let's say you're a low seed in a tournament. Let's That's say true. like a, a 64 player 1v1 tournament, right? And you're seed like 50 or something. Uh, obviously, like really early on, your first match, you're going to face a player that is much, 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 much better than you. Uh, I think there are cool, there are pick band strategies to play around that. There are maps that are not individual maps, but like map pool slots that are kind of known to be quote unquote RNG or lower skill cap, right? So like aim, for example, is kind of one of those. Right. So I think there are always picks that 
uh, are going to be easier than others, not just for yourself, but just for everyone playing them. And so if you're going against a stronger opponent, those are always a better idea to, to uh, hover towards because there's a stronger chance that, uh, oh, well, the other, uh, the, other, uh, the other team or the other opponent is just going to get a random miss and you're not. Suddenly you have a point, you know? Right. If you're playing something that uh, is less RNG, so something that's more of a niche skill set or, or, or like speed or something, I think speed is a little bit different because most of the time it's very binary. It's like either you can play it and you'll do well or you just can't and you won't do well. You right. Know? But I think uh, that, can, that can change a lot. Sim- similarly, again, so on the flip side, again, if you're against a weaker opponent, if you're the, the stronger seed in that situation, um, you would want to go for the weirder picks because you know for sure you are skill capping the other person 100% of the time. Right. Because if you're just playing like a map that everybody can play, like Nomon 1, you have much less chances to do that, I think. Yeah, definitely agreed. I think you... Uh, how do I word this? You want to pick the maps that are that have like the smallest average score gap. Like if you're the weaker team, the other team's always probably going to have like a very high average score on every map in the pool. So just pick whatever maps you are strongest at, and or like maps you have the highest average score, and just hope that the opponent does worse. Um, it doesn't always happen, but I think that's probably the best strategy. And yeah, so All right, one more. Oh, okay. You always pick in the order of most likely to win. No. Yeah, no. Never. Never, never. Uh, a lot of the, again, a lot of the like social dynamics that happen in a match is super important to understand very well. So, like, for example, first pick, first two picks, people are nervous. You can change your pick order around that. Very late in the tournament, like if it's like five to three or something, right? You've played so many maps already. People are not nervous at that point. Like, people are, are, They've cooled down. They're playing at like most of their ability, right? So like that, that can affect your pick order. Right. Uh, what I like to do a lot is I'll start with a weak pick first, not a pick that we're expecting to lose necessarily, but like I would kind of swap like the strongest pick or one of the stronger pick, uh, strongest picks with one of the more unsure picks. So like if a pick is something that you would normally pick super late, like one map before the tiebreaker, and like you're not really sure if you're gonna do well or not on it. Pick that early and right. then save your strong pick at the end so that if you need it, you know, if you if there's a map you're 100% sure you're going to win, you're going to save it for later. And then if you need like a, a swing back, a, you know, if you're losing a lot of maps or whatever, like your your mental boom, you know, pick <laughs> that map. Maybe it'll change things around. Right. As long as you just make sure you pick it early enough so that uh, it's played for sure. Like, don't wait until too long, because then if you lose before you pick it, then, you know, that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. I think that, yeah, mostly ties into the idea of first map nerves or like start of match nerves. That you want to pick the most likely maps to win when you feel most confident as well. And that's not always at the start of the match. So, yes, one thing I do also want to mention about like the previous question, which is like mindset versus weaker or stronger opponents. Try not to get complacent because like if you're the weaker team, and you end up actually seeming like you have a chance, then you are you don't want to be underprepared or unprepared in that situation. And also, if you're the much stronger team and you feel like you're actually about to lose, then you don't want to be unprepared either. So don't get complacent. Um, what about this question about uh, team assembly? Oh, yes. I okay. think that's really good. That, that's part of turning strategy that's a good question right and that also is i think a really common question people wonder how the world cup teams come to be in the first place so yeah do you want to talk about that a bit yes uh so i think this isn't like something that must be followed exactly like there are different ways to build uh, build teams that work for different reasons for example uh, up until recently, I think both Germany and Korea, which are both top three teams or close to that at the time that was a thing, literally just held a 1v1 tournament for their tryouts and took the top eight of that tournament. And that was the OWC team, you know? Right. And I would like to say that's not a good thing to do, but they got like top three. Like, obviously, it worked for them. Like, they were doing well. It's not the way I would build a team, but. That is to say that is something that you can technically do, and it's fine. I think the most optimal way to build a team, though, is that kind of playing around the idea of that you have people that are very well-rounded that will play everything. 
And you don't need that many extra people that can do that. You know, if you pick all eight people in your team to be well-rounded players, it's going to be very hard to tell who's playing what. A lot right. of people are going to feel like they should be on something and then they're not going to be. Yeah. Uh, I think the best way to assemble the team, uh, if we're talking about uh, eight player 4v4, which is like the most common like tournament format, right? Um, is to have, I would say, you pick around four well-rounded players. Maybe you can, you can have a little bit less than that, depending on... It really depends on the player specifically because someone that's well-rounded will still have like a weakness or two, right? Unless you have like, I don't know, like Bubble Man on your team or something, <laughs> right? Like most of the times... If you're picking a well-rounded player, they're still going to have some gaps. So you have like three, four people that are considered to be core. Like you said, uh, you said that about yourself earlier, where you can kind of expect yourself to play every map because you can't. Right. You're consistent at more or less everything, right? So you pick a limited amount of those people, and then you use your remaining four or five slots to pick people that are more specific to one thing. So you pick your speed players, you pick your low AR players, you fill in the gaps that your core players don't have. And so that way the you'll have a, a more full representation of what um how do i word this uh you you can sort of get you you sort of get to avoid something called fourth player syndrome that you right. you may otherwise have because if you're building a team in the context of a 4v4 well, you need four players for all skill sets, and that is very, very, very hard to do. Right. Uh, so you need the right balance of having well enough rounded players and specialists to fill in the gaps where your well rounded players can't play. Yeah, definitely agree. I think it's a lot of team building comes down to like filling in the gaps of your other players, and I can sort of give some insight also into how the USA team is built, or sort of how I think of it is basically like you take your so for each country you take the highest skill cap player and they're automatically on the team um assuming that you know they're experienced in tournaments which typically that is the case so uh let's say for example vaxe very good player he's automatically on the team he probably has some of the highest skill cap in the world so you basically you just take the high skill cap player and then whatever their weakness is find a player that's like the highest skill cap at that weakness and then bonus points if they can do other things as well and then once you sort of have a decent match there then take the next highest skill cap player and sort of do the same thing until you have eight players left so mm -hmm. yeah, and by the time you get to the seventh or eighth player so to sort of round off your roster you're looking for the weak spots in the like the team should already be like five or six of your highest skill cap players and look at those players find their weaknesses and then that's what you want to have your seventh or eighth player be. Like if you realize that like with your six players, if someone picks streams against you, you literally lose because you have like one or two players. Then that's what you want to prioritize in your last few slots. And that's mostly... Kind of expand on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah go. I think that's mostly how it works. Yeah, so this won't be relevant at all levels of play and for all countries if we're... Speaking in a World Cup context, right. I think in the context of a bigger country, so like a high population size of like potential players to play in a team, um, I think when you have a higher pool, it allows you to have a lot of different like decisions that you can make. And so one thing that I did last year for OWC is I took one player. I kind of did the same thing, right? So you mentioned Vaxa for USA. Well, last year I picked Ryuk, who I thought was our best player, and he kind of was. Um, I thought he was our best player, so I said, I'm going to fully ignore myself. I'm going to build a team that is able to uh, make Ryuk shine, right? So I picked a team that is good at all of the things he's good at, so that I, we have the best possible roster for um, some for what he wants to play, so that we kind of have a good chance of playing around one player, oh. right? So. Uh, that's something that we did last year. So as a direct, like that was a uh, direct influence for what the team was. And it didn't turn out like as a complete success. Like we didn't all, we didn't always play around him, but we ended up being the teams that, uh, one of the teams that uh, had the best speed in the tournament. Right. Right. So I think uh, building around your strengths is also kind of important. You don't just want to be able to cover everything. I, I think, you should also have some strengths as much as possible. And one thing that's super important to talk about also is that if you're having a hard time 
plug in all the gaps, bands exist. It's right. completely fine to have a major weakness because you can ban it out, right? Yeah, so yeah. if you have a very specific weakness, I think a very common one it would be like low AR hidden. It's hard to find people that are both well-rounded and good at the other skill set skill sets and also good at that. So what a lot of teams end up doing is you just don't have low AR players and then you just ban it every time. So that allows you to be stronger in every other element of play, right? Like every other skill set. Right. So that's another thing that you can do as well. Yeah, I think try to avoid being a jack of all trades but master of none in your team. I think is is basically what you're trying to say, I think. Yeah. Right. Cuz even if you're decent at one like at everything, you need to still be better than the other team. And if you're only average average on any, everything, then that might not be the case. So Yes. All right, maybe one last one from yeah. from the forums cuz we briefly talked about it before as well. Right. Uh first uh first first ban pick versus a uh, second ban pick, right? What's, oh, uh, that's right. On that? Wait, we actually didn't talk about that, I feel like. Okay, that's no. interesting. Well, we did, but it was before the stream. Oh, so. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Before we actually started. So, yeah. first pick or second pick and also first ban or second ban. So actually, okay, so tournaments these days, I think like you so basically you start the match, you roll both teams roll a number from 1 to 100, and then whichever team rolls higher, they get to choose if they want first pick, second pick, first ban or second ban. Now, I think usually they're paired, right? So it's like first first pick uh, and second ban. And it used, then, that used to be the like, case, but now it's so basically like was it no longer like that? Like oh. if I won the roll then both. it's it, so it's basically like I want second ban more than I want to de decide the pick order. So I basically Oh, and then the other the other guy yeah. picks the pick order. Okay, gotcha. So I decided the ban order now that your opponent gets a yeah. So which one would you care more about locking in the order of pick order or ban order and why Ooh, um well i will say that for both picks and bans i think going first is the worst option i think you want to be second uh not only just for the start of the match but at least for pick order also the end of the match second pick is the last pick of the match before tiebreaker right that can be a very influential pick if your match gets there right so but I think in terms of what's a higher priority between like second pick or second ban, I think that's uh, that's hard to say. <laughs> really? I don't know if you have a preference. I I I think it highly depends on on the context of that match. That's interesting. I think it's one hundred percent ego pick order. A ban order doesn't matter because really? you're banning different things anyway. It doesn't matter what the order is. If you ended up like both teams wanting to ban the same thing, then someone messed up because <laughs> but how yeah. there's always some situations where you're not sure of that you know like how can you be sure that you're not banning the same things um if if you don't have so like i said i, I think it depends a lot on context right so like right. A, an example context is if you're playing in a tournament that you don't have a lot of information for and there's a map that you are bad at well if you don't have the information that the other player or team is also bad at it then you'd want to be banning the same thing without knowing, you know? So if you're second right. ban, there's a chance that um, they ban that one first, so then you get a third ban, essentially. Right, right, right. So, right. so the second ban is obviously better than first ban for that reason, but uh, if you had to pick between second ban and second pick, I think second pick just has a lot more power throughout the course of the whole match mm -hmm. that you don't want to skip out on just to get like one ban out of the way. Because I think like the strategy intel that you get, basically when you're second pick, you can respond to the other team. But when you're first pick, you have to sort of make all the leading choices yourself and sort of pick a bit more blindly because you don't have the intel of, especially the first map of the match, you don't have the intel as to like how good of a day your team, your opponent is doing. So you, and, and also like you sort of have those first match, first map nerves sometimes yeah uh, uh, that's my that's my top reason right the first map nerves if you just force the other opponent to play their strong pick on on their first map nerves then you'll have a much easier time i think right so I, like, I think i can agree with you like in most cases second pick is going to be better right uh yeah that, that, that's my opinion ban, i mean right but i think it's, it's fair to it depends on, on how much you value bans i guess but um personally i think it makes a lot more sense to value pick order especially because 
if the match is very close, then that's when pick order is really going to matter. And that's where having second pick is going to be very, very helpful because mm -hmm. you get the last pick before tiebreaker. But yes, any, any last quick things that you I wanted to shout out? Quickly looking at the form, that's probably the last thing I want to answer. We mostly talked about everything in there. Right. And I'm not sure, will you be able to join us on Friday? That is at that should be, yeah. 4 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, it should be there. All right. Awesome. Yeah. So it's not the last time we'll see you, but much appreciated for joining. And those of you who listened live, ask questions and uh, join us tomorrow or yeah, tomorrow also at the same time, it's just 20 UTC or 22, 22. But yeah, those of you listening through YouTube or Spotify, if you want to stay connected with OC University and these interviews, best thing you can do is join our Discord server. That is pretty much where things happen. And if you want to support our content, best thing, best thing to do is just to spread the word about it to anyone you think might enjoy these interviews or anything like that. But yeah, with that, thanks, Azer, for joining. Do you have any closing thoughts, key takeaways before we wrap up completely? No, that was, a, that was a fun experience. Thank you for doing this. All right. And just to those of you who might want to stay in touch with you, this is your time to shout out your socials. Oh, where people can uh, find you. I don't really use them that much, but I think uh, watch, watch the World Cup and Corsace. I'm mostly uh, active there. So, right. Although Corsace isn't active for a long time, but World Cup is happening now. <laughs> it starts next weekend. Obviously, it's going to be a good time. So, yeah, watch that. Yes. It's very entertaining. That, yes, I agree. And there's some that's good my socials <laughs> <laughs> some good people behind the world cup as well so yeah. uh yes with that well thank you guys for listening and we will see you guys next time